Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this fortnightly Zoom discussion of uh, talking about socialism, a, a, a very loose and informal grouping of uh, socialists to give us an opportunity to talk about socialism in its many different aspects, historical, political, economic, cultural, uh, but from a Marxist point of view. Um, so this evening, our, 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 our guest speaker is Ed Potts, um, who's going to talk about something extremely topical for us in, in this country at the moment. Um, he's going to ad address the nature of the Labour Party that many of us have been fairly recently hounded out of, um, that, but which we invested so much effort for, 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 for the previous uh, five years. Um, and the, the the political compromises and tensions and contradictions within the Labour Party by comparing it with comparing its history and the and the and the the circumstances of its formation in the 19th century and the 20th century with what happened in Germany. Uh, it's really interesting. So you, you'll you'll hopefully you'll have seen on our website Ed's article, Why Do We Have a Labour Party instead of a Socialist Party? I encourage you to read that if you haven't already. I would also draw your attention to the fact that since our last meeting, two other articles have been published on our website, one by the economist Michael Roberts, looking at the, the impact and consequences of artificial intelligence and automation, and the other by myself uh, in defense of Ken Loach, is actually an article I wrote a year ago, uh, but which has become even more relevant today than it was then, I think, um, which is very much talking about the importance of free speech and defending the right to discuss and reinterpret all aspects of history as, as Marxist socialists. So um, we'll follow the, the, the usual pattern for these meetings, which is Ed will give an introduction, um, and then uh, I'll take questions and contributions from the floor. I'm gonna limit each contribution to a maximum of three minutes. And I will be fairly, uh, apologies in advance, but I might, appear to be quite abrupt in enforcing that three minutes. But what we found is, is that it's a very effective way of making sure that everybody on the call gets a chance to speak. And um, once we've had a first round of speakers, um, if people want to come back in again and speak a second time, even possibly a third time, and we've got the time, then we'll do that. So we plan to finish the meeting at nine. Um, and we've managed to be very prompt about finishing at nine so far. So the rest of your evening is ring fenced and protected for whatever you get up to after nine o'clock at night. Um, so I'll hand over now to Ed uh, to talk about why do we have a Labour Party instead of a Socialist Party. Over to you, Ed. Thanks very much, Gary, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so my article, which uh, was published, uh, I think, a few years ago now, um, but uh, the comrades uh, responsible for the Talking About Socialism website very kindly republished it. Uh, it makes a historical argument essentially about the founding of the Labour Party in this country and the Social Democratic Party in Germany. Now both organisations have travelled a long way uh, from the politics that they espoused at their inception or in their early years and uh, the article draws out uh, various aspects of the politics that they had in their early years and the way in which they were founded and the structures they were set up with uh, and tries to draw out lessons for how socialists should organize today and what kind of party we actually need. Uh, I don't propose to rehash the whole historical argument in this talk, firstly, because I think I would just be giving a, a bad summary of the article, uh, which you can all, of course, read and, uh, and, and encourage you to, um, but also because I, I prefer to pick out the salient points and elaborate on what we should do about the problems that are raised by them. So my starting point in the article, and I think the starting point for lots of these uh, discussions that we've been having is the ideas of socialism or communism. I, I tend to use the terms interchangeably. Um, socialism, as I defined it in the article, um, is a, I, I see it as a democratic project fundamentally uh, by which the working class, which is the great majority of people in society who are separated from the means of production uh, and who are therefore forced to sell their labour to, some, to somebody else in order to survive, um, will organise together as a class 
to win the battle of democracy and take power and displace the capitalist class, which is the current ruling class, uh, as the dominant force in society. And of course, having done that, we can then use that power to establish common democratic ownership over all society's resources, build a completely new form of society in which all of those resources are allocated to satisfy human need uh, rather than profits for a tiny minority as under the current system. Now, it should be obvious, I think, to all of us that as things stand, a majority of people in society have yet to be convinced of those ideas. Um, I'm firmly of the view that they can be convinced and it's our mission to convince them and, and to campaign for those ideas and convince people. Um, but as things stand, the majority haven't been won over to socialism yet. Um, socialists are still a minority in society. And so one way of viewing our central task is how we go from our current situation, which is the support, having the support of only a minority, to having the support of millions of people, uh, a majority in society who can bring about that democratic transformation. And the, uh, the argument, I think, in a nutshell, that's advanced by the article, put really crudely, it is that socialists have, broadly speaking, two choices in how to deal uh, with being a, min a minority force in society. Uh, the first course they can take um, is to stand by their ideas and to set about the slow, patient work of organizing people around those ideas, making the ideas as accessible as possible, getting really good at communicating those ideas pe to people and winning people to them, uh, and so on and so on, uh, until uh, majority support is reached. Or the other road so often taken by uh, people in our movement, unfortunately, is casting about for other ideas, ideas other than uh, the ideas of socialism, or indeed other forces besides the organised working class who they hope uh, might be better placed to affect change in society, or ideas which they think are more likely to find an immediate audience in society. Now, the socialist movement, of course, has uh, going on 200 of years years of history behind it and there have been many developments in our movement over that time uh, in different places different countries the world and the socialist movement have both changed significantly since the beginning and so to pose that binary choice of two different paths you can take is obviously an oversimplification uh, and it doesn't really begin to capture the nuances of the various ways in which socialists throughout history have tried to organize. Um, but I would argue that most of the wrong turns, the dead ends, the cul-de-sacs, the mistakes made uh, within our movement come broadly under the second path that I outlined of seeking shortcuts to power, of throwing away socialist ideas in favor of ones which are believed to be more immediately appealing, and of course, of seeking unprincipled coalitions with non-socialist forces which tend to result all too often not in winning those forces to socialism but instead offering a politics of the lowest common denominator rather than the socialist politics we should be advancing uh, the the article also makes the argument that um and it's a it's a, an idea which is steeped in the history of our movement that uh, it's best understood as the unification of the workers' movement with socialist politics. Now, I think we would probably all agree on this discussion that socialist ideas are necessary, but of course, without the perspective that it's the working class of all countries who alone are capable of freeing themselves and thereby also freeing the rest of humanity, without that perspective, those socialist ideas inevitably are going to remain abstract and utopian. There's not really a theory or a framework which says how the change is to be affected if all you have is the idea of a socialist future. If you view it from the other direction, of course, the working class movement expressed in things like trade unions um, without socialist politics is inevitably limited to the fight for reforms and sectional struggles which are really incapable of addressing society's uh, problems in any meaningful or fundamental way. So how do we achieve that merger or unification of the two necessary sides of, of the 
the equation, uh, the workers' movement and socialist ideas? Well, the short answer, which uh, which glosses over a lot, but the short answer is by forming a party to campaign for our politics, to give expression to the organised workers' movement, to expose and draw the veil away from the true nature of capitalist society, to also to directly challenge the ruling class for power. But whether a party is fit for and directs itself towards that task depends to a significant extent on how it's organised, on what forces it bases itself, what programme it adopts, so what uh, proposals it makes uh, for the working class and, and so on. And so a part of my argument in my article drawing on our history is that it's not uh, simply enough to lump together some haphazard combination of socialists and leading representatives of the Labour movement and hope for the best. And of course, the, the Labour Party, as it currently exists and has existed for, throughout its history, provides us with a significant example of what happens, a negative example of what happens uh, in those situations. The logical end point of a party which rejects socialist politics in favour of uh, an accommodation between socialists and trade union bureaucrats, in effect, it is a machine that ultimately will only care about winning elections uh, and nothing much else. Despite their wildly different political views and the different times in which they lived, I think it, it, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say that Keir Starmer is in some ways the logical inheritor of the party that Keir Hardy created. Um, equally, the historical example of Germany's Social Democratic Party uh, shows that a party, just because a party is established on uh, Marxist politics or adopts Marxist principles very early on, that doesn't mean it's immune from the defects of bureaucratization, a lack of democracy within the party, compromise, junking socialist ideas in favour of uh, a nebulous commitment to the movement instead of to the socialist future and the demands of winning elections above all else. It's not a, a guarantee against that by any means. So it's not a simple issue where we can point to one historical example, one party in our history um, over the uh, other examples and say, this is it, this is the golden age that we need to reclaim. But of course, there are examples which are more positive and more negative, and we can learn uh, from both. Um, turning to our more recent history, um, there have been multiple attempts, um, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with, um, since uh, Tony Blair became leader of the Labour Party to establish some form of left wing alternative to try and reach the uh, organised working class uh, that um, was being abandoned or, or, or indeed openly rejected by the Labour Party. And this has taken various forms. Obviously, articles could be numerous articles could be written about each one. Uh, but to give some examples, the, the Socialist Labour Party, whose structures consciously imitated the original Labour Party, notionally including a role for affiliated trade unions within it. Uh, the Socialist Alliance, which functioned effectively as an alliance primarily of uh, Marxist groups along with non-aligned individuals. Respect, in which socialist politics very, took, very much took a back seat and in which elected representatives of the party, not least George Galloway, were barely accountable, if at all, to the membership. Uh, Tusk, a stale coalition in which all co components, um, component organisations all have the right of veto, ensuring that the politics remain sterile and always move at the pace of the slowest member. Um, left unity, in which some of us were involved, in which the dominant perspective was to have a party, which was a good thing, an improvement over Tusk, uh, but the dominant perspective in that organisation was for it to be a so-called broad party, uh, aspiring to reach everybody to the left of Labour, in which socialists if pretended in, fact, in effect to be reformists or social democrats in order not to frighten people off. Um, so w which of these, if any, are the model? Well, I, I would say none of them, uh, but we can learn from all of them. Uh, I'd suggest instead we need a party which is democratic, uh, in which a lively culture of debate and contestation of ideas flourishes. Um, if our class is going to arm itself with the ideas and the plans necessary to take power and reshape society, it, it follows that we've got to have an organisation, a party, 
in which all ideas can be discussed, debated and tested in a comradely atmosphere. No one should have an elevated status within that party just by virtue of being uh, an MP or a councillor. Far from it, those people should be accountable and responsible servants of the party, uh, taking only the wage of an average worker that they represent. I would argue also that any such party needs to have clear and un unambiguous politics. Uh, we need to do away with the politics of compromises and half measures, looking to some other idea other than socialism uh, to, that we think will be more appealing to people. We need to be honest and tell people what, it, what is necessary to really change things. And that's socialism, nothing less. Um, we should be building a party, not a sect. We shouldn't be demanding on all agreement on all kinds of narrowly defined tactics and particular issues and phrases. But instead, we need a genuine united party at home to all who subscribe to this kind of socialist politics that I've outlined. We need a party that's prepared to go further than the leading uh, the, than the leaders of trade unions are prepared to countenance. And if necessary, we need to take them on and argue against them. Uh, we all saw how trade union leaders shrank back, even notionally left-wing leaders shrank back from the truly decisive battles in the fight to democratize the Labour Party under Corbyn, uh, just as in the economic sphere, they've always shrunk back year on year from conducting any kind of fight against the anti-trade union laws. The party would also need to go beyond the sectional interests of this or that narrow workers struggle and an example that springs to mind is the issue of trident where uh, the the views of the unite bureaucracy protecting the jobs of a, a small number of uh, workers who could very easily be re-employed under a socialist system in some other area of work uh, outweighed the needs of humanity to be free from the threat of nuclear war, uh, you might think a, a madness. Uh, the kind of party we need would have to be prepared to take on the ruling class as a whole, to put forward its programme openly and um, boldly, I would argue, that standing in elections openly as communists rather than as part of some broad front um, should be a part of that. Uh, and finally, I think any such party should aspire to be a tribune for all oppressed people and groups um, while constantly retaining perspective of what unites us and what gives us all our potential power to change society in the most fundamental way, uh, which is our separation from the means of production, our conflict with the capitalist class and our potential to win that conflict. So I'll end there. Thanks very much. Perfect, Ted. Thank you very much. And your timing was impeccable. Uh, so that was a, a really clear, interesting, and challenging outline of the of the challenge that we face as as, as socialists or communists or Marxists. Um, and it ain't easy, is it? It's um, you know to 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 get that right fusion between the two aspects of what we do is really hard. So I'm going to open it up now to contributions from the floor. If you raise your digital hand. Uh, I'll try and take you in sequence as best I can. As I said earlier, I'm going to restrict everybody to three minutes at this point. Uh, so, Dave, I see you've got your hand up. It's great. You should go first. Um, but everybody else, please do think about and raise your hand um, if, you, if, you, if you'd like to speak. At this point, it's a good point to do it because I haven't started pounding anybody and saying, how about you speaking? How about you speaking? I might start doing that later if some of you are stubbornly holding out in silence. OK, Dave, over to you then. Yeah, thanks. I'm coming in first because uh, I've got to go in about 10, 15 minutes, which is a shame because uh, really important article that Ed's written. I've got it on my other screen in front of me. And um, I agree actually with every, don't often say this, agree with every single word that Ed said um, about the nature of the party uh, that we should be um, um, working for. Um, I belong to such a party in Greece, Antarsia. Um, which uh, is a revolutionary Marxist organization uh, and is, uh, sorry, Octe uh, Spartacos, uh, which is um, part of the Antarsia coalition. Um, we have to have, I think we have to involve, try to involve the other Marxist sects, S E C T S, and they are sects. I know that. We all know that. 
Um, but more importantly, we have to involve the uh, uh, different layers, broader layers that are coming on demonstrations um, with us and that are in struggle. Um, if anyone's interested, I have written Google Dave Hill Antarsia, and uh, I did write something about how uh, such a party should be formed of individual members, individual members, without any particular group or sect having the right of veto at all. Um, I wrote about it in some detail. Um, what do we do? What do we 16 or 18 people here do? Well, we educate ourselves. Of course we do. And this is uh, one of the points of this whole and many other Zooms that we engage in and live meetings. Um, but uh, there's so many organisations calling for... I'm a member of the Socialist Labour Network, as are some comrades here. Um, and that's not got very far. We're involved in trying not to dominate, but to uh, work with others to set up the type of party that uh, Ed is talking about. Um, I think, I, I mean, uh, I'm part of their uh, discussions, obviously, as a member. Um, but I think the important point, that I'll end on this, I think one of the important points that Ed was raising was that uh, we must be an unashamedly socialist, communist, Marxist party without giving, uh, giving uh, without becoming left reformist, without becoming left reformist. Uh, I thought that was an important part of what uh, Ed was saying uh, at the minute in Greece. Oh, I got 111 votes for socialism recently standing for Tusk. Not because I'm wedded to Tusk, but it was the only game in town putting up socialist candidates. Um, hopefully for the next election, next few months, next year, whenever, hopefully the left will have got its act together and agreed not to stand five separate Marxist candidates in, in constituencies. We've got to get our act together. We've got to work with the other organisations as well as working with different layers. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Very interesting contribution. Thanks. Uh, stay as long as you can, but I understand you've got to go. But thanks for joining us for that time. So next we have Chris Strafford. Um, and please, everybody else, do think about putting your hand up. Um, you don't have to deliver um, a, a, a history-changing thesis, just uh, any kind of thoughts you have or feelings you have about the Labour Party and our experience over the last five years would be worth mulling over. OK, Chris, over to you for three minutes, please. Evening, comrades. Um, I would quickly agree with everything Dave has just said and would uh, urge him to put the link of his article into the chat. Um, but going back to what Ed spoke about, again, largely agree. Um, you know, the winning of the Labour Party historically was a massive achievement for the working class. You know, the idea that the working class should have its own party, should have its own um, representative, its own programme, was worth fighting for over 100 years ago. It's certainly worth fighting for again today. Um, the problem we face, of course, is that 100 years in between, the Labour Party has fallen short in every way possible we could have imagined. Um, it is a state loyal party party that's committed to British capital and the maintenance of the status quo, but it can't be ignored. Uh, but I'm firmly of the view that we can't go through it either. Um, so we do have a sticky problem of uh, what do we do instead? Um, so I do agree with Ed, um, you know, and to quote Einstein, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Um, we can't keep trying to replicate the Labour Party. We can't keep just diverting our entire movement into the Labour Party. We need to be able to build an independent political movement, an independent political party that is based on working class politics, I would say Marxist politics, um, that not only wins the leadership of militant workers, but the majority of workers in society. So therefore, you must stand in elections. You must be part of strike movements. You must be part of social movements. The whole, the whole gamut of our movement um, we, we, we need to be involved in. Of course, it's not preclude that we would work with comrades who stay in the Labour Party or work within the Labour Party and whatnot. But the starting point, surely for Marxists now, um, and military workers and socialists of any, any variety, is that we have our own independent organisation. And, you know, our watchword for the coming period must be patience, which is kind of a strange thing considering all of the crises that we're um, facing as a, as, a, as a class and as a planet. 
but we need to be patient in building up support, building up our organizations, um, one that becomes an integral and useful part of the working class. And if we do that, and I think as Ed has indicated, both in his article and speaking, is that we'll see results, both industrially, socially, and politically. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much. Very interesting contribution. Um, so next we have Samuel, Samuel Mercer. Over to you, Samuel, for three minutes, please. Thanks very much, Ed. I really enjoyed listening. Uh, one thing I was thinking about when you were thinking, when you were talking about the need to create a new party and thinking about developing a communist or socialist or Marxist party, um, I was reminded of um, Gregory Elliott's book, Laborism and the English Genius. And he sort of he sort of says, well, um, Lenin always talked about communists without a party, but he never really talked about a communist party without any communists in it. And that was the sort of his description of the Communist Party in Britain. And so I wonder about whether or not say, making a party that is simply communist in name is, is enough. And I, I suppose I'd like the group to think about what, what exactly would be the sort of the difference that a communist party would have compared to, say, a Labour Party. And I think one of the things is one of the things that you were sort of saying at the start was about a sort of having a, a majority, how, how to get a majority of people to come around to our ideas. But I wonder whether or not the creation of a communist party is something that's more spontaneous with um, a social movement that doesn't simply rely on the sort of convincing of a majority, but rather is a, a culmination of forces which brings people around to a view, but doesn't necessarily rely on their kind of consciousness raising or education. Um, those are just some, some thoughts that I had, but um, I really enjoyed um, your talk and, and thanks very much for taking the time to do it. Thank you very much. Very important perspective there. Um, so I don't have any more hands up. I'm going to take myself for three minutes. So you've got three minutes to come up with what you're going to say yourself and to contribute to the discussion, please. OK, so for myself, um, well, the first thing I want to say is, yes, I completely agree on the importance of democracy for any new organization. I mean, bizarrely, given that, in a sense, communism socialism, Marxism is all about democracy. Marxist organizations have been singularly incapable of actually implementing and pursuing de democratic structures and processes. And, and I think that it is absolutely elemental to any new organization that evolves, that from the beginning to the end, it absolutely is democratic in, 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 a, in a, if you like, in a working class and activist way. So it's based on delegate structures, it's based on recallability of delegates. It's based on committees being accountable and being made to give account to the membership. And it's based on transparency of information and decisions and sharing of documents, just to name but a few. Um, and we ain't been very good at that in the past. The other thing I would say is that, and here I think I want to sort of raise a slight disagreement or a slight difference in emphasis. Um, yes, it is true that we keep doing the same thing over and over again in the Labour Party as socialists, and we'd be mad not to learn lessons from that. But equally, I would say that Marxists and socialists keep doing the same thing over and over again outside the Labour Party in trying to start new parties and new, 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 new organisations, and actually, invariably, with the same results. They, they, they become undemocratic, they become uh, sex, they go nowhere, they end up appearing to the class as though they're just preaching to them, you know, standing on the sidelines with a megaphone telling them the class what to do. And I think that the difficulty for us is that we have to find ways of being part of the class, part of the class struggle, earning their respect by being the best fighters in that struggle. And the Labour Party has always presented with us with some opportunities to do that, as do the trade unions, of course. We don't have that opportunity in the Labour Party anymore. Um, and I think it's a real challenge for us to work out how we can avoid just being the people who've got the answers preaching from the sidelines, because we won't get anywhere by doing that, I don't think. Uh, I'll stop there. Um, I've now got uh, Ian. Ian, over to you for three minutes, please. Good evening, comrades. Um, I agreed with everything it said. So, you know, I'm not taking any issue there. I just have a few things um, thinking aloud, as it were. Should the membership be completely open 
That is to say, um, I, I'm not a member of any party. I've been in and out of the Labour Party a couple of times, like a dose of salt. Um, uh, if I was closest to anyone at the moment, I, I subscribe to Weekly Worker, which I find is quite a good open paper. Um, but I find myself thinking, would I want to join the Communist Party of Great Britain if I was a bus driver without a degree? Uh, and I think probably, no, I probably wouldn't. Um, so do we have a completely open membership or do we have to have some kind of idea that you have to have some basic knowledge, as it were, to be a, a full member of a party? And is that does that pose a problem in terms of um, developing a kind of sex like mentality? You, know, you, know, you only become a, a member once you've passed the exams, as it were. Uh, let's also remember, of course, that when Marx and Engels wrote the Manifesto of the Communist Party, there was no such organisation. Uh, you know, the, the 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 Communist League was a foundation, was a kind of come, uh, coming together of the Communist Correspondent Society and the League of the Just. And in a sense, I get the feeling that you know the the the, the party, the Communist Party, were those that part of the the working class that was politicised for its own liberation. And of course, naturally. Um, people like Marx and Engels were in a leading position because they were able to engage in a, an intellectual current. So while we're waiting and going through the long, hard process, the hard yards of, 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 of developing a, a, a party, um, how will we organise an intellectual current, I think, to try and arrive at a, a theoretical understanding of the present, which is, of course, very different to when Marx wrote Capital Volume 1. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and well within your time slot, uh, which always makes things easier. Uh, so, uh, Nick, you have your hand up. I thought you had your hand up. So I'll hand over to you now for three minutes. Thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks, comrades. Um, like others that have spoken, I agreed with every single word that Ed spoke um, very clearly, very concisely. and. Um, if only it were that, were that easy. So, but we've got um, a number of people on this call um, who've already indicated they agree. I hope that others are in agreement and if not, um, will raise their doubts and questions. Uh, my own view is that um, we have to start the process of doing exactly what Ed was calling for. Um, I don't think we can simply announce a new party, but I think that, that um, we can uh, create something like a, a, an independent Marxist network or some other grouping of people who share these ideas. Because uh, we need, first of all, a clear program, and that's got to be um, under the, the banner or, or the headline of, of, of an aim of actually getting rid of capitalism and uh, not believing that that can be done piecemeal bit by bit or that this society will somehow transform of its own volition into the opposite but that it needs the conscious act of the majority working class in society to take that step to do that act and that that means that the working class majority has to become conscious of its own power and to become conscious of how to use that power to get rid of the undemocratic capitalist state and the capitalist economy under which we all endure. Um, that obviously isn't going to be easy. But I think if we're here on this call, we all at some stage in our life, uh, maybe a long, long time ago for some of us, um, devoted ourselves to the ideas of socialism, communism. Um, as Ed has said, uh, I too use the terms interchangeably. But if we can make that step and see the need to change society, then so can every single working class person. And the problem that we've got is that the, the main working class party, the Labour Party, completely avoids that question. It doesn't challenge capitalism. It aims to manage it. And it thinks it can manage it better than the capitalists. We do have Marxist organisations, and some of us have been in one or perhaps more. And we don't want to rejoin because we have experienced the lack of democracy in those organizations. And that's why I agree with Gary and Ed and others that anything that we go about creating has to be completely democratic from the get go. And it has to allow 
people to express their opinions. It has to allow debate, a difference, and it has to have a comradely environment in which we can discuss those disagreements and differences. I think some here on the call will have experienced being in groups where if you disagreed with the line, somebody came down on you like a ton of bricks. And for me, that doesn't really um, produce um, independent thought. And that's what we need. We need people who want to change society and work with others to do that. I, I think that we can build. Let's wind up, Nick, please. Oh, sorry. OK, I'll stop there. Thank you. OK, thank you. So um, important points there. Now, I don't have anybody else with their hand up. Um, so please, those who haven't spoken, do think about uh, contributing some thoughts. Um, Joe, I'm, wa I'm uh, waving. OK, sorry. So I've got Joe next then and then Soraya. Excellent. So over to Joe. Um, hi, uh, Soraya was first. So if they wanted to take that point first, I'm happy to defer on that. No. OK, well, um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure, Ed, sorry, that I'm necessarily agree with your historical analogy about the SPD. Perhaps I hadn't read the article like well enough, but I, I, I thought that it, you know what you said at some points was that um, the Labour Party and the SPD came very much to resemble one another, and if there was something distinct about these organisations from the start, um, I'm, I'm not sure how they ended up in an almost identical path. But perhaps that's uh, you know not not so important because I think it's the, the idea is about your your idea is this merger formula. That we need to mer merge our socialist politics with the workers movement and that, that that's that's that that should be the step forward and i suppose my doubt about this is i'm not sure there really is a functioning workers movement at the moment um that socialists could effectively merge with now um i think there are opportunities for rebuilding a workers movement in this period um but i think that that might have to be our starting point so i think that it could be that we have to orientate ourselves around organizing around a practical rebuilding of a workers movement and maybe us working together and trying to do that process might build up the kind of mutual trust and respect for one another's ideas that a uh, party could form out of so i think that if we start from sharing experience of practical organizing work um and uh, we try and avoid duplicating basic tasks um and we try and cent have some kind of a centralization of our efforts there then maybe us as Marxists might start getting used to uh, sharing experiences, actively organising in the workers' movement, and then maybe 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 something might develop out of that point. Um, I suppose if I was going to make just one more point, though, uh, Gary mentioned uh, you know avoiding preaching to people, and uh, I, I think that's quite important because, to be honest, comrades, I don't really know what the socialist road is. I don't have I don't, it's not, it doesn't present itself clearly in front of me that I know what we would do or. So when I when I hear things like our correct ideas, I often do wonder what 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 exactly are are those ideas? What what is our policy? And the the, the only reason why I'm bringing this up is because I just want us to you know try and avoid thinking about winning advanced workers over to our ideas as a part of getting people to talk like us. So for instance, let's say you're involved in an industrial dispute and some workers who'd noticed what you've done in that respected the way that you conducted yourselves in that dispute. The idea, I think, really should not be to get them to parrot your language or to start talking like us. Um, I think that actually we've got an awful lot to learn from where working class consciousness, consciousness is at the moment. And I don't think we should be trying to change people um, in that, in that, like educate them in that pedagogic sense. I think we need to be learning from them as much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, I would re really strongly echo those sentiments, actually. That, that goes right to the heart of the, the challenge for us as socialists, I think. Our relationship with, with radicalizing workers are uh, very often in, in, in industrial disputes and how we relate to them and draw them towards socialism. Uh, so, Soraya, now over to you for three minutes. OK. I, I think, um, I think I, I'm, I'm not sure what um, Joe means by a functioning workers movement. I think there's definitely a, a, a radicalization of the class in terms of, uh, as because of their experience um, being hit so hard that, um, that there is, that there's been a radicalization of whole layers. You know, we see the numbers of workers that are on strike, that have been on strike, that, is, that continue to go on strike. 
and layers of people that haven't been on strike before but are and i include people like um uh, the lawyers and um junior doctors you don't think traditionally is the most radical or, or and i say even i don't mean that in a disparaging way but nurses um coming out because of the nature of i say even because of the nature of the work that they do what is so much is at stake if they withdraw their labor um and i think so that means that there is a whole movement out there i'm not saying that people are ready for socialism tomorrow but it's it's an important moment but the problem is is there's no proper mass place for that movement um for that radicalization and so our task is propagandizing for a, a, a proper workers party um there isn't a shortcut to that and it's it's not easy and and the the one of the contradictions is that one of the main some of the main obstacles to uh, uh, between us the class and th and that getting a, a, a I'll use the word proper workers party um a genuine workers party is the uh, as of course is the in the UK is the labor party and the leaders of the trade unions are all doing very nicely uh, for themselves and uh, uh, ed spoke very clearly about the the nature of the the labor party um and what it, it it is and what it certainly isn't so it's a question of what do we do i think and um at the moment it is a question of building a network we can't proclaim a new party of i don't know 15 of us um if everybody on this meeting were prepared to, to do that of course that would would be absurd but i do think that we've got um a, a, a task to do and i think for, for me discussing in these meetings is how to um widen our forces to be able to go and carry out that 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 propaganda work and it, it is because of course it means in, intervening um in our workplaces and supporting other workers who are taking action but and, and that, that's not a question i see it as talking down to people um it's a question of just engaging and exchanging the experiences that we may have or we don't have and that actually the only way you can propagandize is if you are talking to fellow workers to know what's what's going on in their workplace and how people are thinking so that's that, that's my um, view thank you very much Soraya yeah I, to actually be in 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 the throng talking to people is so important to find ways to actually be in there with the with, with workers to actually have their ear um okay so i've got nobody else with their hands up right now so i'm going to ask ed would you like to respond to some of the things that have been said so far and then we can open it up for more discussion and people if they'd like to can speak a second time yeah thanks very much gary um so i i think it's probably worth um picking up on on some of the things that joe said first of all because i thought they were um i mean they they everyone who's spoken made very interesting contributions but i thought um joe's were some of the most interesting and challenging uh, i think the concept of a a merger or unification of, of socialist ideas with the, the workers movement um i think by virtue of it being a, a, a singular noun a unification or a merger it, it almost implies that we're talking about a, an event, perhaps a significant historical event, such as um, the, the meeting which founded the Labour Representation Committee, where a group of socialists were in the same room as a group of trade union leaders and, and other people as well. Um, if not that event, then, then some other comparable event. Uh, and of course, I, I think, uh, not suggesting that that's the way Joe uh, thinks about it, um, but we we must all make an effort to remind ourselves that it's not uh, a single event or a single um, process. It's an ongoing series of multifaceted processes, which will be ongoing uh, for as long as our movement is necessary uh, and, and as long as our movement exists. The, the, the unification or the merger that I'm talking about is in evidence every uh time that uh, any any of us are speaking to some other comrade worker in a in a different sector who's on the picket line and we're talking we end up talking to them about 
uh, socialist ideas and what's necessary not only to win this particular strike or struggle that they're involved in, but what's necessary um, to take things a step further and build the sort of society in which those uh, struggles, those limited or sectional struggles are no longer necessary. Uh, and so I think it's it's always worth reminding ourselves of that. Um, I think as well that um, the point that Joe makes about communication um, and uh, not trying to um, reshape, uh, you know, grab hold of a, a of a worker and, and reshape them in our image, uh, to, to, to paraphrase. Uh, and I think that's an Im important point. Um, it, it needs to, a, a, any socialist who goes out and tries to involve themselves in uh, the working class movement and build support for our ideas um, without heed, without regard to thinking about how best those ideas should be communicated and, and how to um, make them accessible to people. Um, anybody who goes out and doesn't think about those things probably deserves the sm very small audience uh, that they will uh, garner. Uh, it's something we all need to think about and of course something that's um, all the more challenging and difficult to learn uh, when the socialist movement is going through a period of defeats and isolation as, as it has been for, for some time now. Um, but recognizing that mean, you know, is the first step to, to changing things. Uh, and it's something that we, a situation that we can get out of. Um, but uh, at the same time, I think um, we should acknowledge that uh, the ruling class uh, and its state apparatus and its media apparatus systematically try to prevent um, or ward off uh, working class people from the ideas of socialism. Uh, and so the, it, when we're trying to bring those ideas to people, we are trying to overcome that um, unnatural separation of the working class movement from socialist ideas. Uh, and so we shouldn't be ashamed, I don't think, of, of, uh, of our politics. Um, it doesn't mean that we expect everybody to talk like us or become like us. Uh, of course, part of the ongoing and multifaceted unification or merger is that um, all of us will be changed by the experience um, at least as much as any uh, ordinary worker or uh, working class militant who's, who's drawn towards socialist ideas will be changed. Uh, and so there will, there will be change on all sides and there will be change experienced in common as well. Um, so I, I, I think that's in general how I'd respond to that, um, those points. Um, and if I can just briefly take up uh, Gary on something you, you, you said about um, Marxist organisations or self-proclaimed Marxist organisations, uh, which you described as having shown themselves singularly incapable of uh, um, organising themselves democratically. And I think that's broadly speaking, that unfortunately has been the historical experience. Uh, but I think we, we just need to be careful because, uh, of course, Marxist sects, for want of a better term, don't by any means have the monopoly in society on undemocratic organization. Plenty of organizations uh, throughout the political spectrum and, of course, beyond uh, politics as well. Uh, can be organized undemocratically, can have the same tendencies towards um, putting their faith in strong leaders at the top or uh, having tendencies towards bureaucratization. Uh, of course, we, we need to harshly criticize um, and challenge those organizations that say they're Marxist, but fall well short in terms of their organization of uh, firstly, what's required in order to really change things, uh, but also the uh, the aspirations of socialism for a, for a democratic and an equal society. Um, and so we should absolutely criticize them on that basis. Uh, but of course, that may be a reason why their failure to have uh, democratic organizations of the kind that we would uh, want to see, it may be a reason why they're more noticeable. Uh, and so we, I, I, we should avoid, I think, um, and I, I'm sure this isn't a, a point that, that Gary would make at all, um, but in general, of course, um, when people attack our movement, uh, they tend to pinpoint uh, as the common factor in all of this our Marxist politics. And they say, well, the reason that you're undemocratic um, is because 
you're all Marxists and Marxism is undemocratic and we need to be able to push back on that really hard and, and explain and, and, and assert um, that that couldn't be further from the truth. And, and the best way that we do that, I think, is by building an open, uh, comradely, democratic Marxist organisation. Thank you, Ed. Very important points. And by the way, I completely agree with you about that. Um, when I criticise lack of democracy, it's not it's not from the same perspective that um, liberals do. Um, it's because actually, as socialists, democracy is our lifeblood, and without it, we we die just like that. The Tories can be undemocratic and do well. So can the right wing uh, labour rights, uh, but we can't. Okay, so we're now going into a, a, another round of speakers from the floor. Uh, would anybody like to put their hand up? Contribute some more musings? Comment on anything that Ed's just said or anybody else? Nick? Well, Gary, I, 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 I'd really like to hear from those who haven't spoken and, and see what, whether they've got any questions or doubts. Um, something they want clarifying um, that that would assess, that would help the con conversation. Okay, great. I agree. And uh, Mark, you've bravely put your hand up. So please chip in three minutes from now. Um, yeah, I, um, I had the misfortune to go to my, I'm still a Labour Party member, to go to the AGM for my constituency on Thursday. Um, and it's uh it was, it was actually well you won't be surprised to hear comrades it was it's, it's actually quite a depressing uh experience uh attendance was down probably about 50 percent of what it was two three years ago um there wasn't a scintilla of socialism um on the agenda um and to all appearances, uh, the party certainly um, in my area has now returned to being just an election win uh, election winning machine. Um, the Corbyn supporting people largely seem to have left, and it's, it looks like the party is returning to being the moribund organisation that it was before the Corbyn period opened up and um it, it it sort of come away thinking there was a hand there's a handful of us who are still um and mostly actually ex sort of former members of different marxist organizations in their in their younger days who, who and there's a sort of handful of us who was sort of hung on and this turned up um we had a brief discussion afterwards out in the street. What we what are we doing? Why are we here? And I'm still sort of mulling that over. Um, but you know, it's important to come to meetings, attend meetings like this, because I think what I'm sort of feeling, and perhaps I didn't express it enough during the height of the Corbyn period, that I'm a communist. You know, and it's a, it's a word I didn't used to use that word really, but I think that's the, what we should be saying. We're communists because I think you need to be quite almost like give it some shock value because there's a lot of people um, in society out there, a lot of workers, working class people who are completely alienated. Um, you know, especially over the last couple of years and with, with the inflation, and the cost of living crisis, you know, we've got this big strike wave that's that's happened. It's, it's been more so than, than for, you know, a couple of decades. So I think there's a lot of people out there who are questioning things, but there's very little uh, avenue or, or uh, forum where they can where they can do that. And I think perhaps we've got to, Marxists or communists got to sort of coalesce somehow, because we've been atomized, haven't we? Um, and, and sort of gel together uh, and, and be, and consciously send out a signal, even if it's a little, little pulse signal, but it's to pick up some response from somewhere. It's almost like we're space astronauts who've landed on a planet and we've lost our space ship and we're sending out a signal because we want to be rescued we're sending out a signal to other people 
I think, and it's going to be maybe a small pick uh, pick up um, at first. But I think that's the stage we're at. I, I, I some people here, I, I, I tend to think um, maybe you're looking at things in more grandiose terms at this stage. Um, but I certainly don't see my role, uh, uh, certainly, um, you know, at the moment, as trying to rebuild a mass movement. Um, I think really we should be thinking about getting our ideas really sharp and sharpening up and intervening in the mass movements that are happening uh, rather than try to, you know, spending your energy trying to build things from the bottom. I think that those things will, 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 will appear uh, and it's really, we when they are there, it needs a conscious intervention. I mean, that, that's... You know, my, my background is in the, the militant in my younger days, uh, and, I'm, and I'm probably still very influenced by the, their methods of working. Uh, and that's something I picked up, and I don't think that they they were wrong uh, on on that on that particular front. So, okay, sorry, so Mark, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to wind up now. And yeah, sure, sure. You finish your yeah, finish your thought. Oh, no, that's that's more or less it. I was starting, I think I was starting to drift anyway. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so now over to Janet. Okay. Um, I kind of thought I, I wasn't going to say anything, but then I felt guilty, so I will. Um, interestingly, just following from what Mark has just said, I was going to talk about Militant a bit as well, but there was another issue, a very simple question as well, is about the role of leadership. And I'm not going to say anything about that because I don't know. But what is the role of leadership in what Ed was talking about, what people have been envisaging, talking about as well? Because I don't, I don't, I'm not clear about that. But going back to Militant, I wasn't a member of Militant. My ex <sighs> was a full-time Militant organiser. So I know a lot about Militant, all their leading lights, seem to spend a lot of time on our floor, um, you know, because they were coming to meetings and so on. So I certainly met all of them um, and I knew what was going on. Um, and clearly Militant was massively undemocratic um, and it was attempting something that anyway nobody would want or could do now within the Labour Party. It was certainly not open. Um, However, I think what Mark said is to some extent true, that that doesn't mean, you know, should we be not looking at, somebody said earlier about the opportunities, there have been opportunities throughout uh, the time since Labour was, um, became a party, there have been some opportunities and Militant was clearly one of them, even if it failed ultimately um, for all kinds of reasons. But I think there probably are lessons to be learned um, because they clearly did affect thousands and thousands of people. And, um, you know, in and it wasn't just in Liverpool, although it was in Liverpool where it was more concrete and manifest. And, you know, was it just reformism to build, you know, council housing to the way that they opposed the poll tax? And I know they weren't the only people doing that, but is there something to be learned from not their organisation, um, not their tactics in a way, but the way they did manage to um, actually get a lot of people to raise their consciousness, I, I suppose, in ways that actually, who else, you know, not nobody else has done that within the Labour Party. I'm not, obviously that can't happen again. Um, I'm no militant enthusiast, so, you know, but do they have something that um, communist socialists now can learn from? That's all. Thank you very much, Janet. Um, yeah, so I, I think that is a good prompt for us to look at where and how we have an impact and who has had an impact in the past. It's a very important point, how have they had an impact. Uh, I've got David Landau now with his hand up. David, are you ready to speak? Yeah, I'm here. Um, just get coming on mute. Um, yes, a, a few things. I, I again wasn't necessarily going to speak, and then suddenly thought I would. Um, I, I'm David Lander, and I'm a member of Left Unity. Uh, 
And um, so it's interesting. I also missed the first five minutes of uh, Ed's, Ed's, Ed's talk, which means that I may have lost some, some of the uh, some of the flow of ideas here. But um, just to, to say that that's an organisation which, uh, yes, had, had high hopes when it was formed before the uh, Jeremy became leader of the Labour Party. And then uh, lots and lots of people uh, went into the Labour Party thinking that's where it was going to be. I stayed in, in left unity. But of course, it's a, it isn't what it was before. And um, what it's seeking to do at the moment is not so different, I think, from what people are talking about here. Uh, and trying at the moment to, or one of the strands of its activities is to, is to relate to, to other organisations with similar programmatic ideas to work to, with, with them to see if there's possibility of merging or work, working closer together and in the direction of being a party. But that isn't the only thing. The, but the, a, a mass revolutionary party isn't going to come, simply adding add, uh, different small groups together. But it's important that people where they can work together or they can merge, do so rather than um, compete with each other. Um, so that was good. A, a couple of other points. One on um, on Mark's point. Um, I mean, I'm a communist in the sense of the communist manifesto. I think the problem with the word now, because there's been a, rather a lot of uh, thing, uh, things gone down in history since then, is that that for a lot of people, the word communism uh, is, is synonymous with Stalinism and what what happened in the in the 1930s and all this kind of thing. And so there is there is that legacy, which obviously isn't what Marx was talking about, but which uh, has have reappropriated that word and therefore makes it more difficult for us. Um, finally, just as the thing about people I think are absolutely right. Work, the workers' struggle is um, without a mass workers' movement, you can't have socialist revolution. Um, so that relationship is crucial. But I think it's also important to realise that it, that working class movement and trade union are not synonymous words, phrases. And there are, there are sections of the class and, and communities in struggle who aren't, who, um, who, who uh, who are who are outside the the trade the parts of the the movement which are dominated by trade the, the trade union leaders and um, bring to, to issues which which the um, Marxist parties don't always recognise. So, for example, the movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, there is there are it's not a question of going to that group and saying here's the truth. They're telling us the truth. Uh, and and um, and and so on. We can find this with other movements in terms of the way, and if we're going to be democratic and have that relationship with with with, with wider movements, I think we have to recognise that. I'll stop now. Thank you, David. Yeah, very important point about us listening to 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 to, to workers in struggle and social movements as well. Absolutely agree. Okay, so Nick, I've got you had your hand up again. Sure. Okay. So. I, th I don't think anybody in the socialist movement um, uh, would, would, would say that, that it's not important to listen to workers in struggle. Of course it is, and to learn from workers in struggle. But um, also, um, as socialists, we think that we've got something to, to offer. And I'm grateful to the people that taught me about socialism. And I remember one conversation in particular when I was in my late teens, and I said to somebody, but surely if we want to change things bit by bit, and somebody said to me, we don't, we want to do it all at once. And it shocked me. And I went away and I thought about it. And it was one of the formulated, uh, the, the, um, the discussions that helped me to become a Marxist, thinking about how do we change society? And so there, there are programmatic aims that Marxists have and understandings about the need to uh, fundamentally change society. Uh, there are so many points that have come out of this discussion. We're going to have to organise a whole series of meetings to, to discuss different aspects. For example, with Dave, Dave Landau there, I would say that 
um, left unity adopted um, what I would say a completely reformist program at its founding conference in opposition to the Marxists who argued for it to adopt a Marxist program. So it would be interesting to see what lessons Dave and others um, have learned from the process since. It seems to me that left unity has a program that's no distinct, not indistinct from Corbynism. And as a Marxist, my program or my ideas of change are completely different from Jeremy Corbyn. So we need to have some sort of programmatic agreement. Uh, what is it that we're actually aiming for as a socialist group or the socialist party that we want to build? And um, I, I, as I said earlier, I agree with, with Ed's um, general formulations. But I really liked what Mark uh, French had to say. Because at this at this moment, we're a disparate group of individuals, and we've probably all been through the experience that that Mark described. Many of us have been in groups in the past. We've ended up not being in them for various reasons. And we're trying to find allies with whom we can work because Marxism cannot be brought about by one person. It can't be brought about by a small group of people like this. It, it, it can only the, the, the socialist change in society that we aspire to, that we aim for, can only be brought about by the most democratic act ever in history. Uh, and Marxism actually is the most democratic theoretical body of ideas ever in history, in my opinion. And um, that, that's why we say that we need the act of the majoritarian working class to act for itself um, in, in changing society. So the question is, and this is the big, the big question, how do we go from this loose, disparate uh, group? How do we become more organized and how do we re relate to other Marxists, to other individuals and to the movement? Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Um, so I've now got Ian Spencer. If you're ready, Ian. Yes, uh, I'd just like to go back on this question about whether we call ourselves communists or socialists, whether I too would want to reclaim the term communist. Um, it is, after all, the manifesto of the Communist Party. And of course, as we know, Marx and Engels used the terms interchangeably along with a number of other snappy titles like a society of independent producers, a society of uh, interrelated producers or whatever else. Um, we're not going to try and reclaim the term social democrat. I think that's long gone. Um, I don't mind whether it's called socialist or communist, but I think we might as well try and reclaim it. Whatever term we use, we're going to have to um, explain ourselves and we're going to have to explain where we stand. Um, but I'm very much in favour of it being explicitly a Marxist uh, party or organisation or a whether it's an independent Marxist network or whatever else. And I'm also very much in favour of it having a theoretical perspective, um, not to exclude people, not to, but any half decent Marxist organisation would have to have some kind of education programme. And that's what I've tried to engage with, with the kind of Why Marx series organised around the uh, Labour Left Alliance. Um, and also, let's just remember what some revolutionaries did. In 1899, Lenin sat down and wrote the development of capitalism in Russia. And uh, he tried to understand the present. He tried to understand what was so very different about the Russian Empire compared to... And he was like, obviously having an argument with people like the Narodniks who were saying that there's a specifically Russian road to socialism. How different is the world around us today from volume one of Capital? We need volume one of Capital. It is a brilliant book and it gives us the tools that we need. Um, but, you know, Marx isn't right about fiat money. Right? Marx isn't right about a whole range of things. I mean, <clears throat> things like um, the various sort of Ponzi schemes like Bitcoin or whatever else would have been incomprehensible. But we need to understand those things. And we also need to understand the impact of, uh, of imperialism on class consciousness in developed countries like we have. So I think there has to be uh, an intellectual struggle as well. Uh, otherwise, we can't make sense of the world to the workers that we're engaging with. And that's it. 
Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so now I've got Samuel, Samuel Mercer. Thank you. Um, I think there's just listening to the contributions, one thing, one mistake we're at risk of making, I think, is um, is equating uh, democracy, which is very important to everyone here, I think, with consciousness or consent. I think, you know, for example, when you're a member of a trade union, you might not consent or vote for strike action, but nonetheless, you forfeit your individual. Um, you, you forfeit your individual to the collective if the if the union votes to strike, and then you strike. And if you don't strike, then you are you are you are castigated for that because you are undermining the collective democratic decision. I don't think anyone would say that that's necessarily anti-democratic. Um, and I think that you know we've talked a lot about Marx and the Communist Manifesto, and I think it's worth remembering that. In the Communist Manifesto, and indeed in the sort of pamphlets that were written around the time about Al Heinzen and, and Proudhon and so on, they're sort of criticizing the view that was emerging within socialism at the time that socialism was about, you know, consciousness raising and the sort of, um, as um, you know, best matching the views of the masses as we can. It was sort of saying, well, no, actually, communism is about the sort of um, the critique and the analysis of the material and existing conditions and sort of putting that forward within a political program rather than trying to convince people of a particular view because if you if you do this then you're 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 doomed forever to not be able to escape reformism we've talked about reformism because people will always vote for a reformist rather than a revolutionary option um it's just like um Rosanna Rosanna would, would say like it's one of the reasons why people don't strike people there's two reasons why people don't strike for example is if they Think they can get what they want without striking or if they think that what it is that we're striking for is unachievable and i think that you have to carry that over into politics as well if people think that they can get what they want without voting for revolution then they will they will do that so you know if we're if we're serious about um the necessity of revolution i think we need to separate this from a, a kind of idea of democracy that is reduced down to the level of, of consciousness raising and and, uh, and consent in that sense um, Thank you, Samuel. Yeah, good point about how we're not here to accommodate to the majority wish as such in society at any point in time. Um, Chris, Chris Trafford, over to you. Thanks, Gary. Um, I want to come back very quickly to to Ian on um, what he said about bus worker not being able to understand the weekly worker. I mean, I have confidence that any worker, anybody who applies themselves could read Marx. If we believe that, then they can read the, the left press as well. But I think the three important points that I think have come up in this discussion, one from Sam on what is a communist party, um, and then again on democracy and the, 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 the limits of that democracy. Um, what Joe raised about um, whether the working class movement exists. I think that's an important question. Um, I think we as well. And then also I think about the, uh, what Janet raised about the militants. And I'm gonna start there. And if I run out of time, then come back to the other two points, maybe over a pint uh, with those comrades. Um, but my experience since I joined the movement when I was 15, which is a few years ago now, um, at the beginning of the anti-war movement was that Comrades who had been in the militant or alternatively had been in the Socialist Workers' Party um, were great teachers. Um, they were great um, ambassadors for the working class. They were great struggling trade unionists. Um, and those experiences in the militant and in other um, important working class organisations should uh, influence how we go forward not just in the lessons that we need to fix in terms of democracy, openness, um, but also, for example, militants' ability to be a genuine part of the working class. I think these are important lessons that we can draw from our comrades of uh, previous organisations. So we can't do the sex politics again. And um, Gary, what you said about repeating that mistake over and over again is also madness. I, I absolutely agree. We, we, we must not do that. Um, I don't particularly care about the label we put on it. I call myself a communist, I'm for communist politics. 
but the label for me is not really the uh, sticking point. The sticking point is the contents of our politics. Uh, for me, that should be a Marxism, a genuine Marxism, um, where democracy is central, where the working class are not pawns, just to be moved around a chessboard by some leadership in waiting. But they are masters of their own future. And we, as workers, participate in that struggle and fight for a communist future to become not only a reality, but to become a dominant idea amongst the majority of our class, because that is the only way in which that we are going to succeed. And I think I've used up all my three minutes. Um, thank you, Gary. Thank you very much, Chris. Very disciplined of you. <laughs> very good. Uh, Soraya, you, you, you wanted to make another contribution? Over to you. Yeah, sorry, I keep turning. Anyway, it doesn't matter if you can see me or not. Um, I I agree with um, Mark. I think it's important to uh, wave the flag, flag both literally and um, and not, uh, and not shy away from from um, uh, using the word communist. I mean, I actually think that I'm not sure that it's true now about a whole generation of youth that you know Stalinism, because I think that waves of people who've who've no idea about when communism became uh, equated with Stalinism and an absolute lack of democracy. Um, and uh, it, it, it's um, so I think when we were younger and I talk about myself, because Stalinism was much more clearly um, uh, uh, equated in that way. I think that um, youth um, that are active and activated and searching um, just as we did in the past um, and are still doing, from, from my part, still doing, um, seeking answers and, and a desire to change society. We can meet and exchange ideas and we should be bold and we should be confident, not only because of our ideas, but I'm also confident because I, I'm absolutely confident that we are not unique. Um, I, I it's just we can't we need to reach those people who share our ideas um, and it's a question of entering into dialogue with them as long as we we're not abstract and we use accessible language um, to be able to convey ideas without people's eyes glazing over um, and, and not to act as if for some reason we think we're superior because because we aren't but to also to discuss our own experience because it's 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 what's formed us, be, be that theoretical, um, but also our experience in 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 our, in the workplace and and in general generally in the labour movement. And I think all of that is part of being a communist and um, and seeking how to change society. And by saying that we want to convince other people, it doesn't mean we're superior. It just means that we understand that um, the ideology capitalist ideology which makes people it sets out to try and make people think that they are weak and uh, isolated is a, a big thing to overcome but, but but we should be confident that we can do that thank you Soraya uh, so I, I'd like to make a brief contribution and I, and I think Nick wanted to say something as well and then what I propose because I haven't had any other hands up is to hand back to Ed for a for a few minutes summary. Um, so for myself, um, you know, we're at one point in the swing of a pendulum that's been going on for the last 120 years with the Labour Party. And um, as somebody else said earlier, Starmer is a natural successor to, to, to Hardy. Um, and uh, he hasn't had it all his own way either, by the way. There are still strong forces in the party that may not be Marxist socialists like us, but nonetheless are constraining the extent to which he can turn it into um, effectively a liberal party. Um, now, I mean, truth is, I would go back into the Labour Party in the future if I, if, well, first of all, if they allowed me because I've been expelled, but secondly, if I thought there was an opportunity to intervene and have an impact. Um, Equally, right now, it's clear to me that I've got to find ways of being active and intervening in the struggle outside the Labour Party. Um, but, you know, we have to be careful just because we're at one end of a pendulum not to oversimplify and forget what we should have learned over the last 10 to 120 years. So, I mean, personally, I think that one of the reasons why the Labour Party um, 
has not gone to the extremes that some of the social democratic parties in Europe have done was price, precisely because of the organic link into the trade unions and because of the strength of the trade unions in this country. So there are plus points as well as negative points about the nature of the Labour Party compared with, with social democratic parties around Europe. Um, we, we, we can't forget that. And actually, I don't think we can sidestep it. Uh, sooner or later, if there's going to be a revolutionary current in this country, a serious mass communist party, the Labour Party is going to have to split one way or another. We've always said that, and it's still true now. So I, I just don't think we can be too clear about saying, oh, the, the Labour Party was a mistake. You know what? I mean, if I was given the opportunity to go back into the Labour Party again around a project like Corbyn, I would do. My regret is that I didn't loudly and clearly say, I'm here because I'm a communist and everything that goes along with that. I wish I had. I wish I hadn't disguised my politics when I was in the Labour Party. Uh, so I'll stop there um, and hand over to Nick. Uh, well, just just very briefly, Gary, because I know uh, you want to call back in. Can, can I just say that um, one of the things when we get together with a whole group of people who are Marxists or thinking about Marxism and so on is that the language that we use can be very, very different because we've all learned about it in different ways or in different groups or from different teachers or from reading different books and so on. And one of the hurdles that we have to get over in the first place is um, what do we mean by what we say? And I think that may be part of the problem in the discussion that's been going on on the chat with um, Samuel. Um, I'd really love to pursue those. Um, my, my, my own view is that every single working class boy and girl, teenager, young man, young woman um, can become a revolutionary socialist through their experience. If they're, if they're workers, they understand the exploitation taking place and they can understand that a society that ends their exploitation is better and they can understand that the only way of achieving that is collectively. And that's um, really what we've got to try and get across as communists to working class people that we come across in struggle. Thank you, Nick. Spot on. OK, so, um, Ed, would you like to come back in and respond to the discussion and sort of reach your own conclusions based on all the different contributions you've heard for maybe about five minutes or so thanks gary yes i will uh, well thanks everyone for all of the thoughtful contributions that have been made um with this amount of serious thought and debate and um, people willing to listen to what each other are saying and uh, engage with different arguments and, and test out what we think about things uh, i i think it it bodes well um, for us, all of us, and many more people not in this discussion this evening uh, in, in building the sort of organisation that we need with the sort of comradely atmosphere and serious approach that we've identified as being necessary. Uh, of course, I can't possibly respond to, to all of the points that have been raised, um, so uh, apologies to anybody who uh, I don't respond to directly, but I, I wanted to respond to a few things um, Janet um, raised uh, about the, the militant tendency. Well, um, I, I'm in the position, of course, of not having been uh, around at that time. And so uh, my my knowledge of things is inevitably um, secondhand. But I, I think I would echo what Chris uh, said in response to that. Uh, and I think my take on it is that um, for all our criticisms of organizations like that, of which obviously we have many, um, the, the, what a different place our movement would be in uh, today if we had an organization of that size, uh, but also that professionalism and seriousness of, uh, of building a, an organization of, of that kind. Uh, and I think regardless of, of the criticisms, uh, but also taking into account our criticisms, there's so much that we can learn um, from organisations, even if we think they didn't measure up in the same way as we can learn from all of the defeats that our movement has suffered, uh, as well as the victories. Um, Dave Landau, of course, we, we were involved uh, together in, in Left Unity, and, and I think it's important that we talk about that. Um, Dave uh, mentioned that uh, towards the the, the 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 end of a phase of, of the left unity project people went into the labor party uh, of course that was in the context uh in in my assessment at the time of of the people who led left unity um adopting what i saw as a nonsensical position of really offering corbynite politics 
um, while also refraining from getting stuck into the actual movement of Corbynism. Um, but equally, those of us who did um, leave left unity uh, and went into the Labour Party, um, it has to be said we failed to keep together a Marxist organisation um, as a distinct current within the broad left of the party. And so obviously mistakes, uh, I think, have been made on both sides. It's almost a question of who was less wrong in that situation, as with many others. And I think Gary's comments on that were very uh, frank and refreshing. Um, I agree with what Nick said. We, we do have something to offer. We have a distinct politics and it's important we be bold and and, uh, and and not at all reserved about uh, promoting that politics. Um, I think um, I'll just conclude with this. Um, during my time in the Labour Party from uh, what 2015-16 to, um, well, whenever I get around to cancelling my direct debit, um, I canvassed uh, in elections uh, around election time from all over the country, from Plymouth to uh, the Peak District and, and every, everywhere in between, West Bromwich, uh, Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and I think in pretty much every place I knocked on doors. At some point during the canvassing session, there was uh, somebody, a, a very angry person, who'd open their door and would get it right in your face and say, that Jeremy Corbyn is a communist, you're all communists. And really, I think a thought that stuck with me ever since then is, shouldn't we be in an organisation where we say, yes, we are. Um, let me tell you what it is that communists actually want. Let me tell you about all of the lies that you've been told about communism and what communism is actually about uh, and meeting that head on uh, and not trying to uh, hide or, or be ashamed of what we stand for. Uh, but instead finding the best way uh, to promote it openly uh, and to win support for our ideas. So I'll finish on that note. Thank you very much, Ed, and uh, really powerful introductions and summary. Thank you. And wow, what a brilliant discussion. I mean, every time I come to one of these meetings, I'm taken aback by how interesting and rich the uh, the, the, the conversation is. Um, so that was a great discussion, I thought, and thank you all for your contributions. Uh, the, the next uh, Zoom call that we're having in two weeks' time on 26th of June promises to be another really interesting discussion. So we've got Hannah Cross, who's recently published a book called Migration Beyond Capitalism, talking about um, basically how capitalism uses and exploits migration uh, to, to, to divide the class and to, um, to lower wages and to uh, undermine working conditions. And she sort of she tries to tread a line between, on the one hand, the sort of rather liberal multicultural view that, well, migration and immigration is good, it enriches our society, and and um, it it, it uh, does the economy a world of good as well, without recognizing how it's being used by capitalism. And then on the other hand, the 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 the, the rather nationalist view that says actually all these immigrants coming in are just undercutting wages, and we've got to stop them. And she, 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 by by looking at how capitalism actually exploits um, uh, migration, she kind of teases a way through that by which socialists can build cross national solidarity, global solidarity across the class um, in 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 support of migration, but also in support of workers' rights. So great discussion promised in a fortnight. Please do come and join, and tell other people, get them to come and join us as well. And on that, I'll call it a night. Good night, everyone.